for Jesus. We thank you for a chance to walk in a book that we have just dearly loved so far. And we thank you for a man like Jeremiah, who 600 years before Jesus knew about you coming and witnessed of the same. And Father, we ask that every word that would be spoken tonight would be a glory to you and that you would walk among us and not let anything be said that is not a perfect example of your holy and true word. We thank you for a chance to open up your scripture and to study together and to pick about the hard things and make them our own. We thank you most of all now that you promised that you would be with us and we surely invite you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in Jeremiah. We're going to be doing three chapters, five, six, and seven. Let's do a little bit of a review about who he is and where he is. He is one of the major prophets, not because he's any much so much better, because he's a long writer. This is the longest book in the Bible, not chapters and verses. That was done centuries later by men. This is the longest manuscript in the Bible. And so, so many churches have ignored it and will not teach it because of its content. It's graphic. It's hard. It's judgmental. It talks about God being angry. It talks about the fear of God. And it will nail sin to a wall. And modern day America doesn't want to hear this message. That's my only reason why I can think of it's not very well received in churches. In fact, it is by scholars, much smarter than me, uh, ascertained that this book is the most misunderstood, misused, misread book of the Bible, bar none. It's this book. So you're in places where pastors dare not tread. And I'm proud of you for doing that. But you're in a great book. This guy is a, is a man of faith, very much like Isaiah. He is an excellent writer, but he is a um, more graphic. He has more earthy tones. He's almost more sensual in many ways because he's trying to nail the sin of Israel and make it so crystal clear to Israel what they've done. Now, I want to tell you this about him. He is the last prophet before they go into captivity. He's not the last prophet because there are going to be some after they go into captivity that still keep preaching to him. But before Judah is taken captive, this is the last prophet. He's in good company. He's prophesying at the same time as some other giants of the faith you may have heard of. Daniel, who's in the southern part of the Babylonian kingdom, he's taken captive actually before Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is never really taken captive. He stays in Jerusalem. Then Ezekiel's taken captive at the same time. And he's in the northern part of the Chibar Reservoir area with a lot of the captives. You, we've studied a lot about him. We know who he is. And Jeremiah is kind of captive, although he's not ever taken by another uh, group. But he's in Jerusalem where all the sin is. So he's captive by the sin that surrounds him. So he's in Jerusalem. Daniel's in the palace with Nebuchadnezzar. And Ezekiel's in the northern Chebar region. So these three are the four major prophets of the Bible. The only one that's not in the same time is Isaiah, the fourth major prophet. He, he died 150 years before this. But, but these three, God sent his absolute best in these last days to bring Judah into the fold. And here's how it looked. Just, just I know you know this, but it helps to remind yourselves of the history that's taken place. Israel wanted a king. And God said, no, you won't like a king. And he said, they said, we want one. He said, okay. So sent Saul. And you know the story of Saul. He was pretty awful. And then David, who was a, a man after God's own heart. And he didn't do everything right, but God loved him. And from David's lineage, of course, will come Jesus. And David died and his son Solomon uh, uh, assumes the throne. And he's pretty good at first and pretty bad at the end. But this is the lineage. This is the Judah lineage. This is the line of Judah that Jesus will come from. And Solomon dies. And there's a major, what I call civil war, in the whole region of Israel. The 12 tribes split. Ten went north, two went south, I say easy, ten north bad, south good. The ten northern tribes under Jeroboam II became idolatrous and set up worship centers in the northern part and southern part of their territory to worship Baal and Moloch and Shemosh, and they began taking on the pagan rites of the Canaanites. They were awful. 
They were horrible. So some of those ten tribes, really good people, filtered south to be with the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And Travis asked me a really good question last week, and I still don't know the answer to is, why do we suppose those two tribes were better? We said, number one, Judah is the line of Jesus. We know that. But Benjamin is the tribe of, guess who? Jeremiah. So maybe that's it. Jeremiah is a Benjamite, and that's the southern kingdom called Judah. So when I refer to Israel and Judah, it's north and south. Now, at this time in history, the northern kingdom has already been taken captive because of their idolatrous sins. Assyria, who was the big uh, guy on the block at that time, came and took the northern kingdom 150 years ago. They were scattered, never to be reunited again. Never will be reunited again until the millennium. They're gone. Is there some of those ten tribes? Yes, and they filtered south. So they stayed with the Judah Benjamites. And we know there were Levites and stuff that filtered south. We proved that last uh, week in Second Chronicles, how that happened. And so this southern portion, this small little group, Judah and Benjamin, called Judah for the surname, is left. This is where we're at in history. We are on the precipice of them falling as well. 150 years have passed, and they've sunk into idolatry too. They're not any better. In fact, we're going to learn tonight that they're worse because they should have known better. They saw the example of the northern tribes, and they did not learn. And so we're getting into now a few years before they're taken captive. Jeremiah is trying to plead with him. God, you're going to hear God's heart in this. The more I read Mer Jeremiah, I believe he is the one book in the Bible where we see God's heart. And I, it breaks my heart to, to listen to God's words in these things because he really loves his people. And frankly, I think they're dastardly. Uh, I'm pointing back at self, though. I think we are too. And without Jesus, we all look like this. So this is what we're looking at time-wise. We are about to be taken captive, but not yet. Jeremiah is in the region of Jerusalem. He never does get taken captive. And the new group that has taken over Assyria and beat them is the Nebuchadnezzar group called Babylon. They're from, actually... The root of Babel, you'll remember in Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel and Nimrod. This is his, this is his lineage that's coming up the pike. This is the Nimrod group that Nebuchadnezzar now is hosting, and it's called Babylon. That's who will actually take the southern kingdom captive, and that's where you're at in history. So let's... Um, I want to read something to you from an uh, author I like named Campbell Morgan. He says, the work of Jeremiah is like the work of every faithful preacher. His business is to create a sense of shame in the souls of men so as to place corruption before them and to compel them to blush on their faces. <clears throat> That's what Jeremiah tries to do. It never actually happens. Jeremiah is often called the spiritual giant of the Old Testament because tonight we're going to see some things change for him. We're going to see his first public dissertation. Up to this time, he's just been listening to God and writing it down. Remember, he has a scribe named Baruch, B-A-R-U-C-H, that writes everything down for him. And tonight, God's going to put him in the public arena. And from this point on, after tonight, he is hated by all of Israel. All of Israel begins to hate Jeremiah after tonight's lesson because he stands in the open in front of the temple and he tells them the truth, and they do not want to hear it. America, are you listening? Does it kind of sound like that? Yeah, and this is, so he's going to be the last prophet God sends to Judah before their exile, and he is going to tell them over and over again about their national sin. It's not a message they want to hear, and he does not shut up. you got to admire him. I am in Jeremiah 5, verse 1. Run to and fro, fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know, and seek in her open places if you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth. And I will pardon her, though they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. That's a, a pretty short way of saying, um, this reminds me, in fact, of when Abraham ple pled with the Lord and the two angels 
before they want to Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord, could could we could you save it if we found fifty good men? Remember that scenario? He got down to ten. Abraham got down to ten. Then he quit bargaining with God. This is kind of what God's reminding him. If you can find one man that's worth saving, let me know. And Jeremiah didn't argue back with God. He didn't say, Oh yeah, I know of a couple. Notice the silence on his part. That tells you how awful Jerusalem is at that point. So I would like to also say, because I'm going to take this even deeper than that, the one good man that they will find has the name of the Messiah, and they'll find him <coughs> 650 years down the road. Remember I told you, every verse, every chapter, every phrase points to Jesus. He's alluding to the one good man that will come, that will save them, and he will be found faultless. I'm in verse 3. This is actually subtitled Jeremiah's Prayer. Note his wordage in this. O oh Lord, are not your eyes on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to return. Therefore I said... Surely these are poor. They're foolish, for they do not know the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. I will go to the great men and speak to them, for they have known the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Jeremiah here is doing something very interesting. What you can say about Jeremiah is this. He may be tough on Israel. But he loves his people. And he's doing a little bit of arguing in his prayer and saying, God, remember, some of them are kind of weak. Some of them don't know very much. I think I'll go to the leaders. The great many means are the preachers, the prophets of that time. So Jeremiah says, let me, let me, let me go to them. Let, let me get it figured out. Let's do from the top down. Let's get the top people figured out. And then they'll get the bottom. And God's kind of, I think I can just see God going, mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Like they're going to listen. But Jeremiah's heart is for his people. Yes, he loves God and he's going to obey him. But he's saying here, kind of like when Abraham argued, could you find, if I, if I found 50 good men, would you spare it? Jeremiah's saying, if I go to the great men and, 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 I, and I get them right, would it work? And so we have to listen to his heart in this. He's called the weeping prophet for, for very many reasons, but mainly it's because he, he really loves his people. But this is going to be futile as well. Continue on in verse 6. Therefore, a lion from the forest shall slay them. A wolf of the desert shall destroy them. A leopard will watch over their cities. Everyone who goes out from there shall be torn in pieces because their transgressions are many. Their backslidings have increased. This is God saying, um, mm, not going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. And listen to the heart of God. Now, these are God's words to Jeremiah. This is God speaking. How shall I pardon you for this? He's talking to Israel. How shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by those that are not gods. When I fed them to the full, then they committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlot's houses. They were like well-fed lusty stallions. Everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish them for these things? Says the Lord. These are God's words. And shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? Huge question at the end. Jeremiah, I like your heart. I, I get it that you love these people. But they've committed adultery against me. Remember, it's the same old thing. God believes this. He's married to Israel. He considers this marriage relationship. He loves Israel. But they have committed adultery in his mind by worshiping other gods. That's how he considers adultery is happening. And he said, and not only that, they've taught their children this. And then God's questions to Jeremiah are real telling of God's heart. Does he not have a right to punish them? Shall I not hold up my own word, keep my own word to them where I've told them, if you do this, I will forsake you? And he's asking Jeremiah, is this not my right to do this? But look at poor Jeremiah. He knows this. Um, the pictures he gives of the wolf and all that, it's very, very indicative of who Nebuchadnezzar is. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon that's coming up. And when you look up who he was, the lion stands for cruelty, which is definitely Nebuchadnezzar. He skinned his 
opponents alive and skewered them on sticks just for fun. And this is who he was. A wolf is for his veracity because he was known that when he took a city, he would, he would not only kill everyone, but he would layer it down to where there was nothing left of the city and burn it to the ground. So that's the wolf. And a leopard for his slyness and swiftness. He would travel with a several million man army. And overnight, he would take over a whole territory. It, Nebuchadnezzar was a son of the king named Nabopolassar. And when he was t going at his first siege of Jerusalem, in which Daniel was taken, Nebuchadnezzar was the general of Nabopolassar's army. That's his dad. He got word after he took captive Daniel and you'll know some others, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the young men kings of that time. When he took them captive, he got word by horsemen that his dad had died so he took his captives which were the young princes like Daniel and those and went south and then he became king of the world so but he was known for attacking he would he would do a siege around a city and at night when they weren't expecting him, he'd go in and wipe the whole city out so that 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 is a picture of who Nebuchadnezzar is verse 10 go up on her walls and destroy but do not make a complete end take her branches for they are not the Lord's or the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, said the Lord. Notice he's combining both houses now. Israel has already been taken, and he's saying, Judah, you're going to. They have lied about the Lord and said, it is not he. Neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see the sword or famine. And the prophets become wind. Have you ever heard of an old windbag? Mm -hmm. The prophets are old windbags. Now he's excluding Jeremiah. Because he's giving the word to Jeremiah. But see, there's false prophets all around telling people, Hey, you're safe. You're in Jerusalem. This is God's city. Hey, you're safe. You're in the temple. This is God's house. God's not going to let anything happen to his house. Um, what they aren't telling him is God left that house. Yes. If you remember in Ezekiel when the Shekinah glory left and it went out stage by stage and the Shekinah glory, which is the Holy Spirit, looked back in sadness and left the temple. It's not God's house anymore. And the old windbag prophets, the false prophets, God says you're like wind. I love I love the Holy Spirit. His pictures are just perfect. Are basically lying to the people and causing them not to hear for the word is not in them. That's what Jeremiah says. Thus shall it be done to them. I can't get it any plainer than this. Then that very last phrase in verse 13, thus shall it be done to them. Now, this is not my words. That's God's. Do you have any question that is coming? Jeremiah says, nice try, windbags. Keep lying to the people, but God's going to do it anyway. That's pretty much the tale of this section. Verse 14, therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak with this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Here's the picture of the false prophets. I'm going to burn you up with fire and all the people around you just like you're, they're kindling to you. God is a God of fire. If you don't know that, you might get this picture. God is a God of fire, and when you get your new body... The only way you can stand before God in your resurrected body is that you get a new one because otherwise you'd burn up like char and you'd be gone. We can't stand in the presence of God right now in our human bodies. It's just not possible. Read about it. I mean, on Mount Sinai, God had to hide Moses in the cleft and even the back, he turned him. And even when he came down, he was so bright red and burnt that they had to put a veil over him because you can't stand in the presence of this fiery God. Take a look at what Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6. And he looks up and he says, I saw the Lord lifted up and his whole trail filled the temple. And read the description of this fiery mass that is our God. We have no idea in human how we can stand this, but we get a new body. When you get raptured, you're instantly, you're dead in your feet and get your new body and those dead in Christ Christ and they get their new body and then we're in his presence because we're immortals with him but this is what he's talking about he's talking about that fire that fire of God that's going to come out of these old windbags of these prophets he says your mouth is just full of wind and it's going to be I'm just going to burn you up that's a good picture I, I like that and 
Uh, do we hear about a God like that today in our mamby pamby milk toast churches that don't want to talk about the God of wrath and fire? These aren't my words, but I'm telling you, they're pretty graphic. Behold, I will bring a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel. Just in case you don't know, I'm talking to you, Israel. I love it, says the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation. I want you to circle ancient nation because I'm going to come back because there's a real truth here that I hadn't picked up till this week's study. A nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open tomb. They are all mighty men. Mighty men's an interesting term there. Some people believe it's kind of a Nephilimish term. And they shall eat up your harvest and your bread, which your sons and daughters should not eat. In other words, they're going to wipe. When Nebuchadnezzar, he did a scorched earth policy. That's how he conquered. He came in. He took the best of the people he wanted captive. He killed everyone else. And he burnt everything to the ground. He burnt every tree. There were years that Jerusalem was so desolate after this because he does a scorched earth. So this is what God's saying. This, this is who this guy is that's coming in. They shall eat up your flocks and your herds. They shall eat up your vines and your fig trees. They shall destroy your fortified cities in which you trust with the sword. And by the way, that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. He came down. You know, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come from the north. Not because Babylon's north of Israel. I've told you this before. It's actually east and south, but there's something called the Arabian Desert they can't cross. So Nebuchadnezzar has to go up north, come up above that Arabian Desert, come down from the north and into the south, into Jerusalem. And that's exactly what he does. Now, let me tell you, an, a, the ancient nation is so cool. When you do a study on who Babylon is, they I hinted at it a little bit earlier. In Genesis 11, we get the story of the Tower of Babel. Babel, which was instigated by Nimrod, the first antichrist on this earth. Genesis 11 gives you this. I don't have time tonight to give you all of it. I'm going to whet your appetite and hope you study this yourself. It is there that the nations disobeyed God and didn't spread out like he told them to. Go forth on the whole earth and, and fill the earth. And instead, they congregated in a city and began building a ziggurat which is a tower of strange proportions. And as they got higher, it's not about building a city. It's about disobeying God. And they were all of one language. You remember there at this point that God came down with some of the unseen kingdom. Several of his angelic beings came with him and they walked and saw what Nimrod is doing. And basically God said, we're going to stop it now because if we let them go on, we will not be able to stop them. Remember that story in Genesis 11? God spreads them out, puts them in 70 nations and disperses the languages. That is what is happening here. This is who this ancient nation is. And it is very much like Brett sent me a um, YouTube this week about what the, the plan for the one world government is. It's the Tower of Babel thing where we're all in one accord. We have one ruler over the whole earth. Back then it was Nimrod. In the time to come, it'll be called the Antichrist. And what's happening here, this is this ancient nation that God is letting them destroy Jerusalem for this, such a time as this. And they're not going to go away. Yes, they get defeated eventually. You know, the Greeks and the Romans all come in. But that spirit of Babel, that Babylonian spirit, will rise its ugly head in the end times. And the, and the lady that rides the beast, Babylon the Great, will rise again. That's the spirit that you're seeing here. That this is the nation we're talking about. If you want to know more about that, go to Genesis 11 and a good picture. But I, then I want you to take it into Revelation and you see what happens to Babylon the Great. You see, this is the spirit of the Antichrist. Nimrod was the first Antichrist. And as it's filtered down, it's not changed. The devil has not gone away, guys. He is the Lord of this earth right now. And hear me right. We serve the mighty king, the Messiah of all, who is the Lord of lords and king of kings. But of this earth right now, the overseer is the devil. And he is the Antichrist spirit that's in Babylon, that was in Babel, that was in this group from Nebuchadnezzar that came up 
to take over Jerusalem. It is not changed. The devil doesn't have any new plans. He gets defeated by the big guy on the white horse in Revelation 19 when Jesus steps on earth and reclaims earth for him. Right now, it's the devil's. Don't be deceived by that. But that's, that's the picture I want you to get here. God does not do anything without a purpose, and he's allowing this evil nation, and it sounds really strange. You don't hear this much. He allows evil to happen to bring his people into line. And I know that's not an easy topic. God doesn't create evil. He allows it for a purpose, and he is using Nebuchadnezzar for his very purpose to bring Israel into line, and that's tough. Will he use some evil nation to bring America into line? Don't know. Seems to me like things repeat themselves. Just saying. It's worth, worth looking at. But go back and do the Tower of Babel story. It's really, really telling because it's going to raise its ugly head in end times too. Um, I think what you're seeing then is today's globalism. Be very careful when you hear the word globalism because when you pick that word apart, it means a one world government and it goes back to Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. And God was so angry about that. When people say to me, well, how could you be for borders? How could you not want the hungry people to all come in? I said, have you read the story of the Tower of Babel? God made 70 nations, and he sets up the borders. There is exact scripture where he sets up nations, and he sets up borders for this exact reason, that he doesn't want the one world government, which is coming, coming in end times. And this is what we're seeing all over our news today. But mm -hmm. Jeremiah is seeing it here. And the devil is repeating over and over the ancient evil story. So that's today's globalism. And I think uh, the trek back in at Genesis 11 will be a good read for you. Continuing on in verse 18. Nevertheless, in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a complete end of you. Here's promises, promises, promises again. God loves Israel. And he says, I'm really ticked at you. And I'm going to thump you really hard. But I will not destroy you. Do you know why? Not because they're so good. Because he is. He made a promise to Abraham that you will always be a nation, that I will make your descendants more than the numbered stars in the heavens, and God will not go against his word for anybody or anything. Even sin won't make him go against his word because he'll make a way through a Messiah to bring him back. And he does that. Remember the story in Revelation when the remnant flees to Petra, a third of them get it, and they get saved because he shows up on his big white war horse and saves them. That's the promise he made to Abraham. And it will be when you say, why does the Lord our God do all these things to us? Then you will shall answer them, just as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve aliens in a land that's not yours. It's justice. You like serving foreign gods? Okay. I'm going to send you to a foreign country and let you serve them. That's what God's saying. You pick this for yourself. And by the way, Nebuchadnezzar is a heathen, and they serve foreign gods. Enjoy yourselves, Israel. It's kind of a tongue-in-cheek promise he gives them, doesn't it? Verse 20, declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah, saying, Hear this now, O foolish people. You do understand, and I don't have much time for this tonight, so I'm going to throw it out for you. The word fool in the Bible is almost always um, linked to sexual sin. When someone's called a fool, it's because they've been indulging in sexual sin. And guess what? They have been. Remember, they go to these groves and trees and all these Canaanite religions are all sexual religions. And that's what God's calling them there. He said, you're foolish. Without understanding, who have eyes and see not, who have ears and hear not. Do you not fear me? Says the Lord, will you not tremble at my presence who have placed the sand as the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it? And though its waves toss to and fro, that, that yet they cannot prevail, though they roar, yet they cannot pass over. In other words, I made the ocean. I kept the ocean from going across the sand and you don't fear me? Listen to God's heart here, guys. 
And I can't do it good enough, but maybe you can feel it because I sure do. But this people has a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God. It's an interesting trick to go back here and see how many times he says fear. Who gives rain, both the former and latter, in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these things away, and your sins have withheld good from you. Can we say from that passage that if you don't have good things happening in your life, there might be sin? Mm, is that kind of what that English says there in the Greek and the Hebrew? Yeah, I think so. Not my words. Verse 26, for among my people are found wicked men. They lie in wait as one set snares. They set a trap. They catch men. As a cage is full of birds. Heads up, birds is not a good analogy in the Bible. It is a pointer at the devil. These men, these prophets, these evil great men, these evil leaders are snaring men. There was slavery in those days. They did catch slaves. They also snared him spiritually. They told him lies. They told him, you can worship. You worship God. You can worship Baal. It's all good. And it snared their soul like a bird in a cage. And God's saying, whoa. So their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and grown rich. They have grown fat. They are sleek. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They do not plead the cause. The cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper, and the right of the needy they do not defend. These priests were not feeding the hungry. They were not helping the widows. They were not helping the, the fatherless children. They were padding their pockets. Can we do an analogy of American church men, quote, quote, today, that are wearing their Armani suits and driving their Rolls Royces and living in six-figure Houses, I think we could. And how many, I'm, th I'm not going to name names, but you'll know who I mean. There's a, this fantastic TV pastor. Oh, he smiles a lot, and he has a, a gloriously positive message. And he preaches in one of the largest churches in Texas, and it is bombastically beautiful. But when there came a hurricane and hungry, needy people were outside his door, he did not open his doors of his palace of a church because those people were kind of dirty and muddy and might not smell good. And I think we see that same story in Jeremiah. And I'm, God's not pleased. God's not pleased. Nor should we be with that kind of reaction. Yet they prosper in the right of the needy they do not defend. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? And that's that big question again. Do I not have a right as God Almighty to avenge this? He's asking Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is going to ask the people. Remember, Jeremiah is still loves is what God does too. But God said, I can't handle this anymore. I can't take any more of this. <coughs> Verse 30, an astonishing and a horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. False prophets, false preachers, and my people love it. But what will you do in the end? And it was... The three big sins that Jeremiah points out are pretty graphic. The prophets are prophesying falsely. That's huge. And the second horrible sin is the priests are ruling by their own power. They don't ask God for help. They're just making up things. Keeping the money, not feeding the poor. They're just doing their own thing. And the third one is that the God's people were happy to have it so. And that's how that chapter ends. And if I didn't stress to you enough that God's heart in that is broken, then I didn't do a very good job or you didn't read it because God has 
he is laying out the case. Remember last week he laid it out, he laid out the case like a prosecuting attorney. And to this night, tonight, he's gonna to be crystal clear what he's gonna do and why he's gonna do it. And he's not pleased about it. And neither is Jeremiah. They both have broken hearts. I would like to title this the broken heart chapter, but what am I gonna do? God, I don't need to add anything to God's word. So let's continue on. Now we're starting a chapter that's going to be called the chapter of alarms. If that wasn't alarming enough, <sighs> buckle down because this one is going to be. And it's, um, it's interesting for me to think about. Now, Jeremiah is from the tribe of Benjamin. Remember I told you that. And Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. Those are the two remaining tribes along with the ten others. A few people have filtered down. So this is the group that he's preaching to. But he's not preaching to the northern tribe. They're gone. There's no use preaching to them anymore. So remember where the center focus is on this. But this is subtitled the chapter of alarms. Let's continue. Jeremiah 6, verse 1. Oh, you children of Benjamin. He's talking to his own tribe here, right? Okay. Gather yourselves to flee from the midst of Jerusalem. Blow the trumpet in Tekoa and set up a signal fire in Beth Hecarim. Um, those from the north to the south again. That's they're saying the whole kingdom is going to be um, hit with this. For disaster appears out of the north and great destruction. I told you why that Babylon will come from the north. They have to to get across that desert. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. The shepherds with their flocks shall come to her. They shall pitch their tents against her all around. Each one shall pasture in his own place. Prepare war against her. Arise and let us go up at noon. Woe to us, for the day goes away, for the shadows of the evening are lengthening. Arise and let us go by night, and let us destroy her palaces. This is kind of the words of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar will strike at night. He typically does that. Catches everybody off guard, and he has no preconceived ideas of how to win. He will win by however means he can and he's dirty and he's ruthless and he's big this is a big army that will amass upon them um the benjamite tribe also had some other curious people in it some people you may know saul he was a benjamite we don't like him very well although we see him also continuing on in in uh, the kingships and we're going to get another reference pretty here, here shortly into the Benjamite territory. And we're going to see a valley that you may have heard of before. And we're going to talk about that pretty soon, the Valley of Hinnom. This is the territory of the southern kingdom we're talking about. North's been gone for 150 years. We're in the southern kingdom of Benjamin and Judah. And now we're, we're really homing in on Benjamin because this is who Jeremiah, these are his kin. I'm going to tell you after this, he's hated by everybody, even his own family. But he doesn't care because God told him to do it. Verse 6. For thus has the Lord of hosts said, cut down trees and build a mound against Jerusalem. That's a siege mound. It was typical for Nebuchadnezzar to put siege mounds around the town. And he cut down every tree, every, every living thing, burned it, scorched earth. And he built a big mound of earth around so no one could go in or escape the town. And he would literally wait. He waited sometimes as long as four years because his massive army outside was getting all their supplies from further south. But they had, they'd do a siege mound around where the people, he'd starve them out. And as they came out, he'd kill them. If they didn't come out, he burned them to the ground. This is Nebuchadnezzar. This is what's coming. This is a city to be punished. She is full of oppression in her midst. By the way, he's talking about Jerusalem. As a fountain wells up with water, so she wells up with her wickedness. Violence and plundering are heard to her. Before me continually are grief and wounds. The prayers of the righteous are going up, and God's hearing this. Avenge us, avenge us, avenge us. The babies that are destroyed on the altars to Molech are crying out to God, avenge us. Be instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from you, lest I make you desolate, a land not inhabited. Verse 9. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall thoroughly glean as a vine the remnant of Israel, as a grape gatherer. Put your hand back into the branches. In other words, there's not many be left in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to be desolate. It's going to be burned to the ground. In the third siege by Nebuchadnezzar, 
because he does it in three sieges, which is really interesting. First one, he takes Daniel and the kingly uh, princes of that time. Then he waits eight, ten years, and then he takes the group of priests with Ezekiel. And he puts in vassal kings all these different times. Nebuchadnezzar does. And they always disobey him. The third time he's so angry because the vassal king has just ripped him off and done all kinds of things. And he's angry. Wouldn't want to make Nebuchadnezzar angry. He's bad anyway. And so he comes a third time. And in that third siege, he literally burns Jerusalem to the ground. It is said that it's so burning that the temple, as it's burning, the gold is melting off the bricks that the soldiers are picking it out with their knives to get the gold. I mean, it's to the ground. So this is what he's talking about. Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. The preachers, the prophets, the priests, whatever you call them, don't even preach the word, and they don't even love it. And I wonder today, because I was reading that and thinking, I'm just, I'm crazy about his word. The more I study, I actually have to take myself away from it because I just don't want to get away from God's word. I have to actually do some cooking and laundry and stuff sometimes. I don't want to put it down, but I'm thinking if these pastors, these preachers, these priests of this time don't even know it enough to love it. You know pastors like that, that they give canned sermons about Oh, here's the current event for today, and aren't we all feeling good? Go out and be blessed. And I think, where was the scripture in that? They probably don't know the scripture well enough to love it, because I really believe you have to study it to love it. I think you guys can attest to that, because you all feel like I do about that, that the more you study it, the more you love it. And what was happening is here, these guys, these priests, these princes, didn't know God's word, so they don't love it. Therefore, I'm full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. I will pour it out on the children outside and on the assembly of young men together, for even the husband shall be taken with the wife, the aged with him who is full of days. He's, everyone's going to be taken captive. Husbands and wives, old and young, although Nebuchadnezzar kills a lot of them that he doesn't want them to journey with. A lot of the old people he kills. But they're all going to be out of Jerusalem. No one survives in Jerusalem. And their houses shall be turned to others, fields and wives together, for I will... This is God speaking. Stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. I would not want God to say that to America. I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. That's you, Israel, in case you're not paying attention. Jeremiah is pointing this out to him. That's you. God's coming against you. He's not very popular, as you can imagine. There were some, there were some uh, prophets that were well loved. Isaiah was loved. Hezekiah loved him, and they were a great team. I mean, he was well loved until Manasseh came and sawed him in two in a tree. That wasn't so great. But this guy is never loved. He doesn't have a wife, and his family's going to desert him. But he is a real, real harbinger ringer for God, I would say. Verse 13, because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone, notice this, everyone deals falsely. Remember when they were looking for one good man in the city and Jeremiah couldn't think of one? It's because, guess what? Our God explains it. Everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace. That is a bad translation for us in English. Slightly really means falsely. In other words, they have healed the hurt of my people falsely. In other words, they haven't helped, he has, they haven't helped my people. Those priests were false. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. When they ashamed, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. Nor did they know how to blush, therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. I wouldn't want to be a priest other than Jeremiah in the time of Jeremiah. This is what's going to happen to them. And they, they are pretty much all the priests are killed by Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 16. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and the walk in it. Then you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Notice the rebellion of these people. 
And I sat watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. Hmm. Jeremiah is quoted by Jesus in an interesting thing, because I like to lay Old and New Testament on top of each other. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, you'll remember this. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Remember, he's quoting that to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all the people that would listen. How many of those believed it? They, no, I'm not going to do that. He's actually directly quoting Jeremiah there, where God says the same thing. Do this, and I'll help you. And they say, I will not do this. Jesus basically quotes Jeremiah, almost word for word, continuing on verse 18. Therefore, hear you nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people, the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words nor my law, but rejected it. For what purpose to me comes frankincense from Sheba, and sweet came from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifice is sweet to me. History tells us that at this time in Jerusalem, priests were still sacrificing animals, burning incense to the Lord, and having the Sabbath days holy. At the same time, in the other rooms, they were, they were burning cakes to the Queen of Heaven and worshiping Canaanite pagan gods in the temple at the exact same time. History, Herodias and Josephus both record that. This is what God's talking about. Do you think I want your incense? Do you think I want your sacrifices? You've profaned my temple. You've made my worship distasteful to me. I can't stand the smell of what you're doing. Used to, I love to smell the sacrifice. You make me sick. It reminds me of Laodicea a little bit when God says to the church of Laodicea, you make me sick. I want to spew you out. That's what fake worship does. This is fake worship at its worst. And e these evil people still meet in the temple and still do some of the quote, quote, sacrifices. God says, you make me sick. Hmm. And he For, says, yes. he says, the old congregation. <coughs> yeah. The nation, he's talking about the nation. That's the big group. And the congregation would be like the church. Yep. Yep. The congregation is the ones that go to the temple. But it's most of the nation that comes. They still are coming. That's what, this is the dichotomy you see here. It's like the exact, the blasphemy is what it is. But listen to 1 Peter 2, 7. This is what Peter says. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief's cornerstone. It is basically the same thing. He's not, pre God's not precious to them. He's just a convenient act to somehow pacify what they think is right. Now, I don't, I don't want to step on any toes here, but there is a church, big world church, that the people have the mindset, I'll sit all week, but then I, by golly, will go to Mass on Sunday because I need to be absolved. And I better profess that to somebody that listens to me because I'm going to go out and sin next week. Does this kind of sound like this group here? I mean, the devil doesn't have anything new. This idea of let's do our duty to God on Sunday, but then by golly, the rest of the week is mine. That's kind of what the mindset of these guys were. No, God said, I want you all the time. I want you 24-7. You're mine all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Verse 22. Thus says the Lord, behold, a people comes from the north country. You know who that is already, I've told you. And a great nation will be raised from the farthest parts of the earth. They will lay hold on bow and spear. By the way, it was the Babylonians who perfected riding a horse and using a bow and spear at the same time. Nebuchadnezzar got that down to a fine tooth comb. In fact, they were such horsemen that they could... I think of the American Indians like that, but they these guys were... Expert marksmen with a bow riding all at the same time. The first nation to perfect that. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roars like the sea and they ride on horses. As men of war set in array against you, O daughter of Zion. Zion's always Jerusalem, always Israel. You know who she is. That's God's people. We have heard the report of it. Our hands grow feeble. Anguish has taken hold of us. Pain is of, of a woman in labor. We hear that analogy a lot in the Bible, too. Do not go out into the field nor walk by the way because of the sword of the enemy. 
Fear is on every side. O daughter of my people, dress in sackcloth and roll about in ashes. Make mourning as for an only son. There's a reference to Jesus. Again, most bitter lamentation for the plunderer will suddenly come upon us. We get a picture of an only son here that you really should, basically what God's saying here, you want to mourn for somebody, look forward about 650 years and then you can mourn what they do to my son. That's the picture given there. Empty religion, fake, fake churches is causing this people to go by the way of sin. Not unlike today. Verse 27. I have set you as an assayer and a fortress among my people that you may know and test their way. They are all stubborn rebels walking as slanderers. They are bronze and iron. They are all corruptors. The bellows blow fiercely. The lead is consumed by the fire. The smelter refines in vain for the wicked are not drawn off. People will call them rejected silver because the Lord has rejected them. This is another way Jeremiah talks when they smelt silver. They'll burn it very, very high degrees and then little flakes of reprobate stuff falls off, usually to the bottom. And that's discarded. To get the finest, purest silver, you have to have that smelting, that heat, so that it refines it and all the garbage from the metal falls to the ground. And he's saying, you're worse than that garbage that falls to the ground. You're the rejected silver. The real word for Hebrew here is the reprobate. You're like a reprobate. And in, if you understand the New Testament, when God's done with you and you've rejected the Holy Spirit for the last time, he gives you over to a reprobate mind. You will not be saved. These people are not going to be saved from this outcome. They're reprobate silver. I like that image. And Jeremiah is good about giving different idioms like that. But And we're not smelters, so we don't understand that that garbage at the bottom is to be thrown away. That's who Israel looks like to God. You look like the reprobate silver. You're the cast off. Nobody wants you. And that's what you're going to look like. Malachi 3.3, another prophet, says this. He, meaning God, will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. This is not an unusual idiom for God. They would have under, a Jew would have understood that picture exactly. Oh, God's casting them away like trash. That's the picture I want you to see here. The sum up from Jeremiah 6 is still the rejected silver. That's how you have to sum this chapter up. After I get done with you, that's what you're going to... You're not only going to look like that to me. You're going to look like that to the world. Because the world's going to see you and go, Ooh, wouldn't want to be them. They're all taken away. Ooh. And that's what, they're, that's what sin causes. For his promised land, promised people, this is how it's going to look. Now, this next chapter begins where um, he is going to his public ministry for the first time. This is where he's going to stand, and it's probably going to be his very first public discourse. We know this from some other sources historically more than we do the Bible. Jeremiah never talks much about himself. He tells you what God says, but well, I'm going to tell you about him. At this point in time, hatred begins for him from every realm of his being. His family will reject him. His town rejects him. His countrymen reject him. He is hated by everyone. It begins here. So this is a really important chapter for uh, him. It's called the beginning. Chapter 7 through 10 are called the Temple Discourses. It's where he actually, God has him stand at the temple and say these things. So now no longer is God just telling him what you're going to say. Now God said, get yourself up. Buck up, buddy, because you're going to be at the temple and you're going to be speaking to the crowds. And everybody listens. Let me remind you again of the time period here. You know that we talked a little bit about the kings. This is at the time of the king Jehoiakim, ending in K-I-M. We think, according to historical sources, it's going to be about 608 to 598 B.C. Jehoiakim reigned for 11 years. We are going to know it's in Jehoiakim's range. We're not going to know exactly where. So we're, we're, we're within 11 years of knowing when this actually happened. If you remember preceding him, uh, Josiah was the good king. Remember we talked about him and he, um, he knew Jeremiah. And they got along great. And Jeremiah got along great with him. But he didn't follow God. 
And he went out to battle against Pharaoh Necho, and God didn't tell him to, and Necho killed him. And after that, Pharaoh Necho said to him, What are you doing, king of Judah? I don't have any beef with you. And but Jeremiah, I mean, but uh, um, Josiah went anyway, and he got killed. He got shot with an arrow and killed. Well, after he dies, then Necho comes in, and he takes over the kingships of, and he, and he starts placing kings in. So he puts his son in. This is after Josiah dies. He puts his son in, Jehoahaz, and he only lasted three months, so he was not a very good king. Uh, then, so Pharaoh Necho removed him, and then he puts in a, another son named Elikim, but he changes his name. This is what's so confusing about all this. He changed his name to Jehoiakim, and that's who we're looking at now. Now, he's not a good man. None of these, at, there were no good kings after Josiah. And all these are evil kings. So this is the time that Jeremiah is preaching at the temple where Necho's vassal king Jehoiakim is reigning. And the people are following him because he's lying to them. He's evil. And he doesn't love God. And so this gives you, I think the history of this helps set up for what he's going to say. This, uh, so this is a little bit changing in what we've been. Now this is probably his first public speaking. And it's going to be right in front of the temple. So I'm going to take you right on. And we're in Jeremiah 7, verse 1. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house. That's a temple, by the way. And proclaim there his, this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Amend your ways. I'm sure they love this. Don't they just love this? Think about it. And your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord of these. Remember what they were doing. The priests that were evil, the fake priests. We talking about fake news. These were fake priests. And what they were telling the people is, You don't have to worry. This is God's house. He's never going to let anything happen to his house. This is God's city. He's never, this is the promised land. God promises to us. He's never going to let anybody take this over. Lies, lies, lies. Because all that living in that promised land, worshiping in that temple, were contingent on people following God, which they did not do. So here's Jeremiah standing and saying, Nice try, guys. That's not true. So you imagine that's not very good. Um, <clears throat> anytime they talk about Zion, it is a heads up for you. It is a city of, often called the city of David. Or the Temple Mount, or Jerusalem, or Jerusalem's Western Hill. Um, so know where that area is. We're talking Central Jerusalem here, and when they talk about Zion, you you need to pick that up. Is what that is. The Northern Kingdom had been taken captive in 701 BC by the Assyrians. You'll remember Sennacherib and that group of barbarians who came in. So that don't even get confused with that because um, let me tell you what happened and, and it's a really good review because Jeremiah will refer to this. Remember Hezekiah and Isaiah were really good friends and they got afraid because the Assyrians had taken most of the northern kingdom were coming to Jerusalem. Hezek king Hezekiah is a good king. Jer I, we know who Isaiah is, a godly prophet. And so they began praying in the temple, and the, and the people began praying. This is when God was still in the temple. And the northern kingdom mostly had been taken, and, they were, and, and Sennacherib with his Assyrians were coming down to get Jerusalem. And Hezekiah and Isaiah prayed. And here's what happened. Overnight, God's, the angel of the Lord came. They had encamped, the, the Assyrians had encamped about Jerusalem, almost making a siege mound. And, and overnight, the angel of the Lord came and killed 185,000 Assyrians overnight. The way the angel of the Lord, if you don't know who that is, that's King Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. As the, as the troops were laying side by side, he killed every other one. So that in the morning, this massive quarter of a million strong army awakes and half of them were laying dead beside him. The others turned tail and ran. Sennacherib, the chief of the army, 
ran north, and as he did, his sons were so angry. When he got into his temple, Dagon, the fish god, and was praying, his two sons killed him. And this is how God helped Hezekiah and Isaiah. Now, you know what? These people that Jeremiah are talking to know this story. And they begin mulling over, well, maybe, maybe God will send someone to save us, too. He saved Jerusalem before. Remember King Hezekiah? Remember the prophet Isaiah 150 years before? Well, we're just going to believe God's going to do that same thing again. The difference is we had godly men praying. Remember Jeremiah in the very first part of this lesson said, God said, can you find one? Go through Jerusalem, find one good man. And Jeremiah couldn't think of any. Well, we had Isaiah and we had Hezekiah and, and all of the people that were surrounding them in that temple were good and godly men and began praying. That's the difference. So the people of this era remember that what had happened the century before. Remember that God saved Jerusalem by killing 185,000. I gave you all the reference to that. If you've not read that story, it is in 2 Kings 19. It is a wonderful read. It's one of my most favorite parts of the whole Bible. And I love picking apart when the angel of the Lord shows up because I can prove to you that's King Jesus all over the Old Testament. In his, that's a theophany, if you want that big word for that. And I've just done an aside to tell you. So when Jer Jeremiah is standing up and preaching what's going to happen, people are going, oh, no, no, no. Remember what happened with Isaiah? Remember what happened with Hezekiah and God saved us? That's what he's going to do again. Uh, Continuing on, verse 5. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods in your heart, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Yeah, look what all they have to do. Do they do any of those? No, they're, they're not following him in any way. Continuing on, verse 8. Behold, you trust in the lying words that cannot profit. Wow. And I underline that. You trust in lying words that cannot profit. I think we could say America. I think we could. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, for instance, to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say... We are delivered to do all these abominations? God must, must be saying, really? Really? I, I just feel him doing that. Has this house, which is called by ne my name, become, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I even I have seen it, says the Lord. You will note that same phraseology is so cool. Because in, in verse 11, where he says the den of thieves, I'm going to take you to the New Testament, where two different times Jesus uses this. Jesus quotes Jeremiah a lot. Follow with me in Mark 11:17. Then he taught, that's Jesus, then he taught saying to them, Is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you, he's talking to the leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests, have made it a den of thieves. Uh, he's quoting Jeremiah. Luke 19.46, saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Do you love it when Old and New Testament are not separable? Isaiah also, he's a hundred years before Jeremiah. Listen to what he says. Isaiah 56, 7. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Isaiah is looking forward to the millennium when God's going to restore the house of prayer. And it won't be a den of thieves. But Jesus himself quotes Jeremiah, and there are many commentators. I'm just going to say you can think about this as you want to. Kind of hint that Jeremiah is a forerunner of Christ. He is a foreshadowing of Jesus. You're going to see this in a lot of ways because Jeremiah takes on the Pharisees and Sadducees of his days. He takes on the temple. Remember when Jesus got his whip out and cleaned the temple? Many people begin to see a simile between Jeremiah and Jesus. And I think what we are is always pointing to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think so. You can decide that for yourself. 
Shiloh, um, we're going to talk a little bit about, let me read the verse and then we'll, I'll take you to what that is. But go now to my place, which is in Shiloh, where I set my name at first and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear, and I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house which is called by my name. Uh, that would be the temple in Jerusalem, in which you trust, and to this place which I gave to you and your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all of your brethren, the whole posterity of Ephraim. What is Shiloh? It is 18 miles north of Jerusalem, and it was where the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant stood after talk after. Uh, conquering the land of Canaan. After they got the promised land, God set up the tabernacle. Remember, it was traveling. It wasn't a temple. It was a, the ark that moved. And he set it up in Shiloh. And when they disobeyed him, he let the Philistines come and destroy Shiloh. The Ark of the Covenant was no more. They didn't have a place to worship anymore. And that town was pretty much wiped out. And God says, you know why that happened in Shiloh? Because you didn't obey me? Same things happened in Jerusalem. They should have been shaken in their boots when they heard that reference. Because every Jew in the hearing would have known, oh my gosh, Jeremiah is saying he's going to destroy Jerusalem. Because he destroyed Shiloh. Because it became pagan. They weren't worshiping him. And that's the analogy that any Jew listening at that moment on that temple step to Jeremiah would have thought, oh, no, that's going to be a wipeout. So he, it was actually destroyed by the Philistines. God allowed a pagan nation to come and destroy Shiloh. He's going to allow a pagan nation, Babylon, to come and destroy Jerusalem. That's the analogy. And it's going to fit perfectly. If you want to read more on that story, Joshua 18 and 22 have a graphic detail about that. We don't have time tonight. It's a really good read. And you'll understand. God doesn't put up with sin. He just doesn't. And even the idol worship, they think there's they think there's safety in like a temple, a building, or an ark, or their or their priests. See, that's all fake worship. God said the only safety is in me. Your sin is going to provoke me to destroy all this outside stuff that you value. Uh, Psalm 78, verse 58. They provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him. This is God to jealousy with their carved image, images. When God heard this, he was furious and greatly abhorred Israel so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had placed among men. By Jeremiah's day, Shiloh had been in ruins for a hundred plus years. And it showed that that hosting or that house that God had had the ark in did not mean anything when they sinned. He destroyed them as easily as a snap of a finger because as it happened in Shiloh, it was going to happen in Jerusalem. And it was a very hard message for the people to hear because they knew exactly what it meant. Continue on verse 16. Therefore, do not pray for this people. This is what God tells Jeremiah. Now listen to this. Nor lift up a cry of prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. In other words, doom's been cast. They've chosen their fate, and I am not changing my mind. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women need dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? The reference to the Queen of Heaven, I'm going to take you in some deep things here, and you can decide what you want to from this. They were actually wor worshiping the Babylonian, quote, quote, little g, God, Ishtar, a woman identified with the planet Venus, whose worship was similar to that of all the cults of the Canaanite goddesses Asherah, Ashtaroth, and Anath, and was probably introduced into Judah by the apostate king Manasseh in 2 Kings. Manasseh 
2 Kings 21, 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hezibah, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal and made a wooden image as Ahab king of Israel had done, and he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord has said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. This is inside the temple. He built altars for these. Also, he's made his son pass through the fire. In other words, he burnt his baby son up to Moloch. Practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, and consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Manasseh introduced this, worshipped the Queen of Heaven. And it was said that the ladies baked cakes for her. That if you understand the root of the hot cross buns in England, they were originally made in that shape for this worship of this quote, quote, Queen of Heaven, Ishtarte. Ashtoreth is the same name. If you want to know a picture of her that we have in New York Harbor, she's also called Lady Liberty. That's Ashtoreth. That's the Queen of Heaven that they were worshiping that we have in our gateway to America. Just saying. The devil doesn't have anything new. He uses the same thing over and over again. And God's saying, you do this in my temple? You let the women bring these cakes in and give them to Ishtardi? Ashtoreth, or whatever her name is. She's lots of names for different people. But this goddess of heaven was a statue they laid things in front of. Now, I'm going to take you here, and you may not like it. There are many theologians that believe the representation of Mary as a goddess of heaven is fashioned off of this goddess, little g. Do with that what you want to. She's also called the queen of heaven. God is not pleased with that, nor do I think Mary would be. But they are worshiping the Queen of Heaven. If you see any analogies with that into modern-day Catholicism, then you run those parallels. Anyway, I'll let you answer that for yourself. When in, We're going to find in Jeremiah 44 more about this. Jeremiah 44 and 19. The women also said, And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did we make cakes for her to worship her and pour out drink offerings to her without our husband's permission? That cake filters on through the centuries and becomes the hot cross buns in the English society that they use to worship with. Verse 20, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my fury will be poured out on this place, on man and on beast, on the trees of the field and on the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. And Nebuchadnezzar did that. He burned everything inside that scorched earth theory. Verse 21, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, and your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsels and dictates of their evil hearts, and went backward and not forward. Since that day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have even sent to you all my servants, the prophets. I told you this time he's preaching to them. The big guns are telling them the best that God has. Daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they did not obey me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. So this vain repetition of their, of their religions, this false religion, is, is leading him down a narrow, strange, evil path. Verse 27, therefore you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not obey you. Now here's the sadness for Jeremiah. He's just started his temple ministry. He's just started his public speaking, and God tells him right off the bat, you're going to do this, and they're not going to hear you. Listen to those words. But they will not obey you. So sad. You shall also call to them. But they will not answer you. <coughs> Go ahead, Jeremiah. Nice try. It's not going to work for you. 
verse 28. So you shall say to them, This neither is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord their God nor receive correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. Cut off your hair and cast it away and take up a lamentation on the desolate heights. For the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. For the children have Ju of Judah, this is the southern kingdom, have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house. That's the temple, <coughs> which is called by my name to pollute it. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, which I did command, which I did not command, nor did it come to my heart. Here's what they did. The Valley of Hinnom, you're going to know Jesus is going to refer to later as Gehenna. It's another name for hell because it's a valley right outside Jerusalem that the trash of the city is burned. To this day, if you go there, there's a smoldering smell of the Valley of Hinnom, Gehenna. Jesus actually calls hell Gehenna because of that smoldering smell. They would have altars set up for Moloch who held his iron arms out like this. And it would blaze, they would start a blazing fire at his bottom of his feet. A very large idol. And he would, it was ironish, metalish. And as he got hot, his whole arms, they'd lay their infant babies on his arm and they'd burn up in their sight. And that is what they were doing in the valley of Hinnom. And Jesus talks about that being like Gehenna. You've heard that word before. This is what was happening. And and he's God's saying, I saw you. I see what you're doing. And the sad part for me in that pick apart of that section is God said, to burn sons and daughters in the fire, which I did not command. And listen to what else he says. Nor did it come into my heart. God said, I didn't even think about that. You are so evil that not even, I didn't even think that you would do that. That's how evil he is. I gave you several references for Gehenna where Jesus mentions that. That is the valley of Hinnom. Verse 32, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it will no more be called Tophet, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Tophet until there is no room. In other words, you're going to be destroyed. The corpses of this people will be found for the birds of heaven, for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. This also takes you to Revelation, where there's such mass slaughter that the birds and the beasts come and eat. It's the same picture. Then I will cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness. The voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. For the land shall be desolate. I know this is tough stuff, guys. Jeremiah is one of those writers who's not in for fun and games. And I really think when you study this to the death, if it doesn't pierce your heart for America, then we've become kind of calloused. And that begs the question, what shall we do about it? Well, we shall be loud, and we shall be vocal, and we shall not be ashamed, and we're going to proclaim the mercy and the grace of the blood of Jesus until he comes back, because, guys, we are soon approaching the days where that Valley of Gehenna thing are going to be in your face. We're murdering babies. We've murdered 65 million babies on the altars of Moloch in America. We call it abortion. It's no different. Mm -hmm. The devil doesn't have anything new. And there will come a recompense for that because there is for Judah. There will be for America. And what we do is we change. We speak out. We tell of his glory and we tell of the promise. Because there is going to be a shout and a trumpet and a cloud awakening that I want to be part of. And I want to end with something that I think will help. Because God doesn't just chastise and hit and bang and thump. He gives a promise in every one of his messages. One of my favorites from Jeremiah 32, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? That's the question. He asked a lot of questions. God asked a lot of questions in this, but I want to end with that question, and we say, of course there isn't. So can he change America? Absolutely. Can we make a difference? Yes. Shall we? 
That's the question tonight. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that we take this hard stuff, we learn it, we remember it, we speak it, we live it, we pray it, and we do it. And most of all, that we turn to you in everything we manage to fathom from this lesson, that it might be a glory to you and that we might bring others to the cross. And if anyone is listening to this message and doesn't know you, God, bring them to the cross. We thank you for the promise that you're coming again. And, oh, Lord, keep us true by the blood and the power of your Son who is risen forever and ever in Jesus' name. Amen.